The Earnestly Speaking Podcast is a show that is founded on free-flowing conversation and may at times venture into mature subjects. Listener discretion is advised. Earth Me Podcast coming to you February 15th, 2023. How you guys doing? Back here like it was last week. Not like Sunday when I did the shorter, like, you know, reaction pods of the soup bowl and all that. But like 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 last week Wednesday's episode, coming to you live from my bedroom. <laughs> my bedroom because I can't move. In fact, today I had a setback. You guys been know I've been, fo- you, I've been following me in the last couple of weeks and I've been going through it with my bulging disc in my neck. I'm doing therapy currently, um, which is going very well, actually. Uh, I go three times a week. Um, I, do decom- I do decompression on my neck as well as uh, um, a cold therapy, ice therapy. Um, I also do a little ice therapy here at home as well, too, which has helped. Um, so I've been on the mend for the last it's about two weeks now. About two weeks now, I've had this little issue with my neck. Um, But today, today I had a setback. Welcome this morning. On my left, similar to the day when this first started. I woke up with pain in my left shoulder again. Now, this has been common, really, uh, even the last two weeks, even when I haven't gotten better, because they say, because it... As I mentioned too, also um, in addition to having the bulging disc, I also have osteoarthritis in my neck. So, um, you know, with the inflammation going down, which I, which has been the case. Um, however, you know, I will feel soreness in the morning in that area, whether it be my neck or my uh, uh, my arm. But what's happened is that I've. Uh, you know, gotten over it, and within the first hour, it's gone, and then I can, I can function again. Not so much today. Not so much today. Today was uh, was tough. My entire arm has been sore the entire day. Um, the pain levels are the pain levels are about a five out of ten. Um, is the most pain I felt since starting going to uh, therapy for this. Um, I actually need to ice after I finish this podcast, which I will do. Um. But it's been it's been rough. Um, it's been really rough, and um, so obviously you know I'm trying to I I, I need to get back you know into th- you know to doing this thing. But what happened last night was that um, I basically slept wrong. One of the things my doctor has told me, my chiropractor has told me, is that and he gave me a pillow for this. Is that he need, I need to start sleeping straight up, stop sleeping on my sides, especially because I need to. One of the things that one of the things I'm doing also in addition to healing my my neck is also I need to get back to curb my neck. So the certain pillow I've been using that he gave me that's helped with that. The issue with that for me is is that I have issues sleeping prop sleeping properly. In other words, I, I need to sleep straight up, but I can't. When I say straight, I mean looking up, not on my sides. And you know, 40, 43 years of living, you know, I'm, I'm used to sleeping on my side. It's hard to break a habit, a forty three year habit into into a week. You know, um, we can have, um, but that's the case. That's, that's, that's the situation. Um, so in, with that, you know, I, 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 I may have to make some adjustments here at home. Um, one adjustment, one major adjustment has to be probably, uh, sleeping downstairs on my, uh, my couch. That's a more narrow and it's actually more, you know, conducive to me to straight sleep straight up because you can't, if you turn away anyway else, you're going to either going to be, you face face first in the couch on on the on the on the, uh, the cushion, or you'll be your ass on the floor. So, considering all, all op- considering all options as well. But I'm really tired. But I think I'm also um, under some stuff right now currently. So I feel good, feel relaxed right now. Um, but hopefully the setback will be temporary. I need to get back to my normal job and my at work, which is dealing cards. Hosting's fine, but you know you gotta get back to you know making you know back to uh you know, I don't know 
Sorry, no, I, a little bit of a rant. A little bit of a rant there. I I I apologize. Anyway, I'm actually distracted. I'm, I'm actually um trying to uh, you know, distract here because I'm trying to bring up my notes for the, for the show today. Um, what's on here? Oh yeah, so oh yeah, so yesterday was uh, Valentine's Day. Thank God it's over. Ugh. So my wife yesterday, she know and she knows this. She goes through this every year. I am not like I am a traditionalist. I, I, I say it all the time. I am a traditionalist. You know, I I believe in old school, a lot of old school theories. Oh, but, but also a progressive a progressive tinge to it too. Also, I understand we need we need to move forward and grow, but I do like certain traditions that I like to keep. Um. However, Valentine's Day is not something I really care for. I never, I, and I've never really, honestly cared for it. Even with that, it's with my wife, whether we're dating or marriage, all the girlfriends I had in the past. You know, I I did things for them because it was important to them. But I can do without the overall specter of what Valentine's Day. And I reminded her yesterday. Listen, I don't care about Valentine's Day. Like my thing is this, and I. You know my 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 quote my my uh my slogan here is about I I I, I love to me is a seven twenty four seven three sixty five think situation uh love day every day okay not this February fourteenth and not only that not and to boot really let's be real here why would you want to go to a restaurant um on the day of Valentine's Day where it's Literally, uh, just to book a seat, you gotta wait two, three hours to get a seat for a nice, nice restaurant. That everybody's doing it at the same time because they're doing the same goddamn thing you're doing. Like seriously, why would you want to put, put yourself through that? Like even in the past, when we've, we we celebrated Valentine's Day. My wife and I were simple. We sit home and make little lunches for ourselves, or dinners for ourselves. One of the traditions we have is we would watch an old school movie. Like one one year we did uh we watch all the Batman's because Valentine's Day happened actually happened to fall on one of our, day, our days off. So we watch all the Batmans, for example, all for, uh, you know, all the original all the way through the uh, Batman and Robin, and uh, we sat there. We made fried chicken. We ate fried chicken and ate mac and cheese. We had a southern dish, one of the most awesome Valentine's days ever. We did this took years. This, this is pre kids. I think this is pre marriage. Actually, we're talking two thousand eight, nine, whatever. Um, that's what we did. We we got some mac and cheese and fried chicken and just watch uh, Batman. Oh, Bat- the Batman uh, trilogy or the four the four movies, uh, Batman, Batman, Batman for Returns, Bat- Batman Forever, and Batman and Robin. So that, that that's that's how we celebrated our, uh, our our Valentine's Day back in the day, back in the day when you know we didn't have responsibilities that we do now. Uh, but you know it is what it is. You gotta grow, you gotta grow up, right? You gotta grow up here. But uh, Valentine's Day is not for me, man. It, it's it's and it's really never. I'm not saying that you listener to this podcast say. It, 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 look, if you want to celebrate Valentine's Day, go right ahead, dude. I mean, no, no one's stopping you, you know. But it's not. This is not for me, man. I, 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 you know, it's just one of those things where, like, I, I don't fall into these corporate, like, even with Christmas and I, and I, we enjoy Christmas as a whole, like the holidays. Like, I don't follow all the traditions of Christmas anymore. I don't think we should be. I think it's way too commercialized now. And look, well, what I'm saying is not popular. I'm probably the Get off my long guy. I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm in forties. You know, I get that. It's not my thing. It's not my thing. So, anyway, all right. What else on the docket here? We got things to talk about here. I want to get us. I, I want to get us into forty between forty and forty-five minutes. Um, yeah, football's over now. Although there are two leagues are on the way. I think XFL is coming. I think next week or week after that. And then the USFL returns also after a, what, a 20, 30 year uh, absence, no, almost forty year absence actually, um, in April. And people people ask me, "Well, are you gonna watch the XFL? You know, the USFL?" No, I'm, I I don't plan to. Like I I if it's on TV, there's nothing to watch. I have nothing to do. I'll probably watch it. I think what I want to say is this: I'm not gonna I'm not going out of my way to watch these two promotions or two leagues. And it's not because I don't want to. It's just I don't have the fucking time to do it. I don't, I really don't. Like, and not only that, I'm I love football. I love the NFL. But you know, unlike years ago when I didn't have a family and all this stuff, and and when I was younger and didn't have a, a care in the world what goes on. You know, back in the day when I when the NFL ended, 
I be I get depressed. You know, I get really depressed about it. You know, because it's gone. It's, it's all gone. Um, and then it comes back. It's like, oh my god, it's back. I, now I don't mind. Like I, I said on the show a couple weeks ago that one of the cool things about one of the positives about college ending in December and then you know NFL is coming down to a close as we get through the uh, these weeks um, was that you you get at least at least on my end anyway you 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 get a part of your life back. Like one of the things I do a lot with my wife, we binge shows together. But the falls is the fall is hot. It's tough because. NFL's here, college ball's here, NBA comes back around in October, you know, baseball playoffs going on. So the 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 times I would have to watch the stuff with my, with my wife, it, it gets taken away because I'm I'm watching football and all these other things throughout the, throughout the fall. But now football ending now, you know, and being done, I get a lot of my life back. Like Sundays aren't so restricted for me anymore because you know I don't have to work. Like, like I, I, I just watch basketball, but basketball to me is every, is every day for me. If I miss a game or two here, there's no big deal. Um, but you know, I I, th- I think another thing too with football and part of why I think I've I've come to an even better appreciation of it now in, in my forties is sometimes you have to miss it for you to appreciate it. I mean, I, I feel like sometimes you have to, you have to, for you to really enjoy the thing that you love sometimes, and you need to let it, it's, you know, you, gotta, you need to let it go away for a little bit. It's hard to appreciate it without missing it. It really is. Like, let it go away for a little bit. You know, football's done. I mean, only that, we have, we have, we have the little narratives. You, have, you still got free agency coming up a couple weeks. Still got the draft coming up a couple weeks, after, a month or two after that. So there's still things coming up, you know, in, in, in the NFL. You still got to talk about, you know, and we'll discuss in the podcast, of course. Um, but it's hard to appreciate it without missing, without missing it. So that, let, let it go away. And, and and in my case, as a sports fan, I still got basketball. I still got NBA basketball. You know, and you know, I have the playoffs coming up very soon in the next two months. Uh, you know, you, you baseball returns in April as well too. Uh, hockey, you know, especially the playoffs, I'm I'm I'm, in, I'm heavily into it. You know, and but, but the thing is, too, like I said, in addition to all that, I I, I still also have a life. You know, I liked. I, I like to be broader about things, you know. I, I love to read content. Like I'm, I'm, I'm back on my Audible thing now. I'm actually reading books now on, on there regularly, like for the first time in, in a couple of years, you know. Uh, things, things of nature, you know. I, I, like I said, there's a lot of things here I'm doing that, you know, you know that sometimes it's okay to, to be without that football or whatever the thing you love. It's good to be get away from it, you know, because because when it comes back, you, you're, you're fired up for it in September, you know. So. I don't know. I, I it, 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 it's the old saying, you know, absence with Mr. Mr. Hartwell founder. It's a real thing. It, it's it's a real thing. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at now with uh, with uh, football. You know, and you know, I, I don't know if you guys saw the Super Bowl odds recently. Um, got, got released right after the game was after the Super Bowl was was, was done on Sunday. So I'm reading the uh, Vegas Insider. Uh, Super Bowl odds here that, that's, that was released a couple days ago, and I take some issue with some of it now. Right? Obviously, Casey's the favorites to uh, return to the Super Bowl next year in the AFC. The NFC favorites, San Francisco, the Niners on in the NFC side. So I got Casey as the favorite. Buffalo next at plus eight eight fifty. San Fran at three and plus nine hundred. The Eagles are plus nine hundred. Bengals plus nine hundred. So basically, the Bengals, basically the, the, the Niners through the Bengals are pretty much uh, even there. Uh, Dallas. It's uh at plus fifteen hundred, uh, Baltimore plus fifteen hundred, Chargers plus two thousand. Sorry, Baltimore plus sixteen hundred. The issue I take with the odds here is that I would I would probably put Philly at a San Fran right now. This even though the Super Bowl court situation is going to be pretty serious now, especially with a uh, uh, Brock Purdy probably going to be out for six to eight months. We start hearing, and even then, it's that that's still probably missing part of camp, if not a whole, whole all of camp. You know, is you know does that Trey Lance end up being a starter. Um, what happens there? Do they go after Aaron Rodgers? I mean, there's a lot of options for San Francisco. Philadelphia seems more stable. I mean, they're going to pay Jalen Hurts. Obviously, that's, that's a lot of free agents going to leave and lost couple, two coaches there, both the offensive and defensive coordinators and the Eagles. So I can see the reaction there. But I, I think Philadelphia is in a good spot. I, I, I trust Nick Sirianni. Obviously, trust Nick, obviously I trust uh, Jalen Hurts as the man. Um, who, by the way, is probably, I'm not saying he is, but probably a top five quarterback in the league now. Uh... I actually had the Bengals higher than this, honestly. I, I probably put Bengals higher than San Fran. Or at least, I had, uh, you know, I don't know. Buffalo's too high. Um, who's to say Buffalo's going to get better this this uh, 
off season. Uh, who's to say their windows not closed? It's very possible the windows closed. So Dallas, of course, right in the mix. Plants lifting arguments. Baltimore, and the, and that Baltimore one's gonna be pretty funny because Lamar may not even be there next year. So obviously, if he gets traded or you know whatever, they, that will fall heavily. Obviously, um, my Giants are plus. Uh, Four thousand, no chance, right? <laughs> Worst odds here: the Houston Texans have plus twenty eight thousand. Uh, as well, actually, you got two teams there: Arizona also plus twenty eight thousand, Indy plus two thousand, uh, Atlanta plus twenty five hundred. Ah, uh, well, whatever. These teams all suck anyway. Um, so that's that's where we're at with the uh, odds here in the uh, National Football League heading into next year. Like I said, free agency change things, and a lot a lot of time between now and training camp. So. It's like, like I said, enjoy being away from football football because you appreciate me coming back. Tell the basketball. Tell the Miami Heat. Uh, Pat Riley, the godfather, the goat, whatever you call it. But uh, if you go on Twitter, on Heat Twitter, you be you you probably you probably uh, get a lot of hate. Pat Riley hate on there. Uh, but a lot of people think Pat Riley lost his, lost his fastball. You know, the Heat didn't do anything in the, in the uh, trade deadline last week. Which which was done last Thursday, you know. But these these fans need to chill. The Pat Rally hate like, oh, he's been on a, he's been old, and he's he's, he's do this this and this and that, and you know he has to he you know Dwayne Wade gets all the credit for the LeBron big three thing, and there's some facts there. There's some there's definitely definitely a case to be made there, but you know these fans need to stop. I, I think some of these fans have been gotten really spoiled the last couple of years. You know, his expectations, of course. They want to trade Kyle Lowry. Here's reality. If you know that Kyle Lowry's not good, Kyle Lowry's not good. If you know that, and I know that, why wouldn't you think another team knew that also, too? Why do you think someone else w- w- would want Heath's garbage just because? You know, just, just, just because. Who are you to not know that the Heat were trying to pitch offers to, to trade him? The reality is he can't trade right now. He's, he, he still has another year in his contract. His contract would be more be, be more enticed to take on next year, because he'd probably be another buyout candidate down the road. No team's taking on a Kyle Lowry right now, where he has thirty million still left to be paid next year. That's silly. Now, do you want to argue that it was a bad signing, which I said even back when it happened? Yeah, go right ahead. In fact, I'm the one that I told you guys. It wasn't that I didn't want Kyle Lowry. He's a good player. Is that I didn't want, I didn't want Kyle Lowry at ninety million dollars? That was my my whole uh, worry. The whole thing. I kept saying this to you guys that I would rather take Goran Dragic. Now, obviously, I'm a little biased there because you guys know I'm a, I'm a big fan of Goran Dragic. You know, I would rather take Goran Dragic on a cheap. He would cost it less, and he can go year to year. He give you flexibility. So, if, if there's a Pat Riley error, that's the one there. You know, it's, it's probably a couple. I think, and I've been critical of Pat Riley for years too, also, but. The disrespect he's lost his fastball. I don't want to go that far. Number one, I don't think he's the he, obviously he makes a lot of decisions because he's the president, but he has way more input. I think you guys can credit for it. You know, between Andy Ellsbury and some of the scouting guys, obviously Eric Spoelstra has a lot of influence on that as well too. Some of you guys need to chill. I don't know as far as he's lost his his, his 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 touch or his fastball, but you know, I mean, he made some mistakes. I mean, it's, it's okay. You know, you, you know, not not every. You know, even <laughs> even Steve Wonder had, had duds. You know what I mean? Like, like relax. It's all good. It's all good. Um, let's see here. Joe Button, rapper, podcaster, has now weighed in on the Michael Jordan, LeBron James argument. But his take is actually pretty interesting, though. Um, in talking about Michael Jordan, because he actually defends LeBron here, but he's basically sitting there saying that the Michael Jordan probably isn't the goat, most likely. And his, 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 here's his his thoughts on Michael Jordan. It goes on Mike. So, enter Michael Jordan. He comes into a not only a weak Eastern Conference, but an Eastern Conference where everyone, everybody is on coke, cocaine. And they admitted to this. While he was over there doing that, Bird and Magic were fighting it out. They had to fight it out for the best players. Mike was over there somewhere learning how to play, learning how to score. By the time he started ta- taking the spotlight from these old heads, them old heads, they they were just that old heads, and then marketing takes over because you need a face to the league. David Stern's genius. Michael Jordan is, now becomes the fucking face of the league, but still in the nineties, what other dominant guards were was there? I get Isaiah Thomas, nineteen eighty nine, nineteen ninety, and ninety one, but after that he was sitting there 
just dominating these big, these big sl- slow, bum-ass centers. I'm calling him that, but they wasn't bums. He dominated, and nobody was able to get a ring while, my, while Michael Jordan played. He was the best we have ever seen. Now, that's the argument he's making for uh, LeBron, or for Jordan, rather, as to why he probably is in the go. He's explaining why, you know, Jordan had it pretty easy in, 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 you know, in, in, in what he got. Now, on LeBron, he goes, quote, LeBron's path of greatness, LeBron, LeBron's path of greatness is, 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 what, is more challenging. This is where my LeBron argument starts. When LeBron got there, guards, guards got there, and a lot of them, and a, and a lot of them, they and they were all they were more athletic. The rules changed too, but they were a lot more athletic. And when you had a deal with them in their prime, prime Mello, prime Durant, prime Steph, he had to deal with them in their prime. They'll knock them for all those trips to the finals without winning. But NBA GMs were literally building teams to only deal with LeBron James. Surely by the people that he had to face and what he's done and what he's still doing at age 38. He shouldn't be averaging 30 points a game at 38 years old. The tenure in which we've seen him dominate, we've never seen him dominate. We've never seen him like maybe like that, like that before. I'll call Mike maybe the greatest scorer I've ever seen. And maybe it's because I don't know he's, he's that. <sighs> I think some of the points that Bud made here is pretty valid. Some of the points. I don't know if I agree with everything else. Like, there is there is truth to that. When Jordan started winning his rings, Bird and Magic were already 10 plus years in the league. And it took him three, four, four tries to beat Detroit and Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas at that point already had two rings and three finals appearances. So, there's the argument there he's making is pretty good. Add with the marketing. Added with David Stern, and then the NBA, let's be real, and I just, this is the argument I've been making with a lot of friends, and the more you, you think about it, the more it's actually, it sounds viable. The NBA in the 90s were, the NBA in the 90s were watered down. Teams were watered down. You remember too, also, they added a lot of teams. Between 1988 and 95, they added more teams to the league. Remember, they had the Heat and the Hornets in 88. They added the Magic and T-Wolves in 89. And then, I think in 95, or whatever it was, they added the Grizzlies and the what was the other team that that came in the league? Um, whatever, two teams. Oh, Raptors, Raptors, ninety five. So the league got wore down by nineties. So and Jordan benefited off of that. Now, the case he's making for LeBron to be better, I don't agree with. It, but but I, I I like his case he's making. I don't know if I agree with him though. Um, overall, that puts him over the top. Because the, the the one thing I hold against LeBron, and I don't even talk about the finals. I think the six and zero for Jordan, make, making a case of Jordan being greatest of all time, is just as lazy as the knocking LeBron for the six losses in ten finals. I think both are lazy. Follow me here. I've been saying this for years now. The reason why I have Jordan and LeBron is because the one thing I hold against LeBron heavily, a big demerit, a huge demerit was his performance in 2011 NBA Finals. Now, some of you are going to say, oh, well, of course you're going to be mad about it because you're, you're a Heat fan, so you're, you're, you're going to hate that because he hurt your team, especially the team that went out winning that title the first year of the Big Three. No, it's the fact he didn't show up. Is that the thing about LeBron James in that series, he, 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 had, the Heat won that, had, had the Heat won that series, most likely the Heat, Dwayne Wade would be the MVP of that series, not LeBron James. That's the one series where, Le, where LeBron had, had to be carried a couple games. Um, and I'm sniffing like a motherfucker. Um, <laughs> uh, y- you know, um, the issue is that LeBron did not show up. LeBron plays almost scared. He, LeBron James, look, LeBron James in, 2000, in the 2011 finals short circuited in that series. That's the one thing you can't ever say about Michael Jordan, even in his losses. Michael Jordan, even in his losses, emptied the barrel of his gun. He gave it all. Remember, that Detroit series in, in, in 90, 1990, or 1989, whatever it was, the first, one of those two years, if not both. <laughs> you know, they lost before they over the hump. Michael Jordan averaged 35 plus a game, 37 points a game, 37 points a game in those series against Detroit. And, and, that, and that's a vaunted Detroit defense. <sighs> um, So, the, the Jordan left all on the table. He would die trying. LeBron in 2011 literally short-circuited and didn't know what the fuck was going on. Like, watch games three through five in that series. 
LeBron, like, what the hell? And the worst, worst part is that he was never that he wasn't that way at all leading up to those finals. Something happened. He just he really short circuited. He knows that too. He really does. So that's what. But the the, the thing I pushed back on, and, and I said this last time when we were discussing LeBron and the the you know the whole thing with the uh, uh, look at my phone here. There it is. Um, the whole thing with uh, you know the Jordan LeBron argument is that the only thing I push back on is that I, I have Jordan one. But it's not a runaway. Like LeBron's closer than people get credit for. That's the only thing I push back on. I don't. I push back on the whole I ain't close part. It's closer than you think. Okay, it's closer than you think. LeBron's number two for me. The Kareem number three, and you guys are on the list. But you know, like I said, I I think the argument that that Button brought up here honestly was not not terrible. The, the part with the cocaine part is hysterical though. <laughs> I, I, had, I had to chuckle on that one. Uh, speaking of LeBron James, Shaquille O'Neal, Hall of Famer. One of the probably ten best players in the history of the league. Um, jealous LeBron. Um, last week, of course, LeBron passing Kareem for the uh, all-time scoring leader. Um, and uh, we see here, uh, Shaq um, admitted. I don't know where he was. Like, he's on extra. I think he's on extra with Melvin Robert. He goes, uh, I'll, "I'll read the quote here, basically saying because he he had a, he interviewed LeBron after the game on TNT after they uh, after uh, he put well, the record." And I guess he was doing an interview on Sunday. I don't know for whatever reason. Uh, but it brought up LeBron, of course, in the scoring title. And he said this. It was a professional jealousy moment, he told uh, Melvin Robert on Sunday on, on Extra. If it was me, I would have been arrogant for 19 seconds. I know he's a humble kid. I know he is going to give the, ans- give the answer. I don't want to be involved in the debate with who's greatest. I am jealous of having the conversation. Everyone would be put, put in, that, in that position. And he's talking about himself. Uh, you guys know my feeling on Shaq. I, I, I have a love hate thing with Shaquille O'Neal because I think Shaquille O'Neal, especially through 1999 through 2002, one of the most dominant forces in the history of the sport. We're talking about era, like st- stretch of era. Like I would say, one of the top three most dominant stretches of any person in the league. You know, I say Michael Jordan's one at 91 through 90, 98. Wait, nine ninety eight really? Shaquille O'Neal was fucking dominant, and Shaquille O'Neal was, dude. Like before Shaq put on the weight, and we talk about like Shaq in L.A. was so dominant that he makes Shaq and Orlando forgettable. And yet Shaq, Shaq and Orlando was fantastic. Shaq and Orlando was still probably a top ten, fifteen player of all time. But the jealousy part is that it, this is Shaq recognizing that. He left a lot on the table. Yes, he has four titles, won three in a row in L.A. and all that, and he's widely considered a top 10, maybe 15 tops, uh, 15 at, at worst, player all time. And he knows left on the table because him saying he's jealous tells you that. So, you know, whereas, and he, doesn't get, he, he doesn't get that, he doesn't get that best of all time discussion. He gets the one of the greatest centers of all time, definitely top 10, 15 to top 10 player all time. But he doesn't get the greatest, greatest all time. And again, just the guy that Shaq, you know, I, I mean, to his credit, he's he's super aware of, of, of that, which I respect. You know, he he, he cost himself. He cost himself because him getting surgery on, on company time when, when he hurt his toe back in 2002, he, he regrets that, of course. And him not taking care of his weight and taking care of himself. He, Shaquille O'Neal could easily add in more, three to five more dominant years in the league, which will put it probably at 2000. 2009-ish where he's actually dominant and then actually he can trail off a little longer after that but he, you know by the time he got to, to Cleveland and Boston in his career he, he was way out of shape you, you can see it yeah because Shaquille, Shaquille O'Neal should be it's supposed to be one of the greatest players of all time probably the greatest player of all time he's not because he costs himself that and I hate saying this too high because I'm, I'm I'm on the good Shaq side right these, these days on the positive Shaq thing these days these days um Shaquille O'Neal is the most disappointing all-time great player in the history of, of basketball. And probably all sports, if you think about it. Shaquille O'Neal should have worn four rings. Shaquille O'Neal should have at least five rings. Shaquille O'Neal should be where, t- where t- Tim Duncan is and how, he, how he's revered. Although it's, Duncan's a little more quieter how he, how he does things. So I understand. But at least, this is why I respect Shaq there. At least he acknowledges it. At least he, he recognizes that, yeah, I left a lot on the table. 
Hell, if, Shog- if me and Kobe could have been good, Shaq and Kobe could have been great and 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 and, and, uh, and gone along, you know, through those years and fixed the, fixed their situation. They're going to add another two or three more rings. Maybe they win in 04. You know? Maybe they do. Anyway. But, uh, yeah. It's good to see Shaq uh, at least admit that. No, I, I, I respect that. I really do. So politics here real quick. Uh, Nikki Haley uh, is announcing and was, has announced um, in a video that she is running for president of the United States um, for, for 2024. Now, look. I think we all know the truth here. Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter. Nikki Haley has no shot of winning the election. Nikki Haley has no shot of winning the nomination, much less the much less the presidency. Okay, but a lot of these a lot of these people who run for who run for president know that too. And what but what but what they're doing is that there's a bigger purpose and not, and not just win for president. There's a, there's a bigger purpose here. Why these why these people do this? Well, first off, I think she's doing this to angle for a possible VP, vice presidency spot, assuming. Trump wins the uh, nomination, which I still think he will. Um, but also, bigger picture, and I'm sure this is what everybody does in, on both sides, is that this is also positioning themselves, each candidate's positioning themselves to grow their brand, their brand in the, uh, well, in her case, be the GOP. So, you know, maybe you, you may not know Nick Haley on, on, a, on a national stage right now. You, she'll may lose now, but maybe she does well in a campaign season, and then it propels her to 2028 or 2032 to run for, you know, for president of the United States. Who knows? Um, but we, I mean, we all know she's not going to win the fucking. She has no chance. Okay. But the, the bigger thing here, take away and hear her running because we know what's going to happen in that, in that is that point one for Donald Trump here. Nick Haley was a Trump administration official. She was the ambassador to the UN. Um. Look, it's probably going to be Donald Trump. Well, Donald Trump's already declared. Most likely, Ron DeSantis, Ron DeSantis our, our governor here in Florida, is going to most likely enter the race. And many people believe he has the best chance of defeating Trump um, to a nomination. But here's my thing. I, 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 and I think a lot of people believe, agree with this also, too. The bigger the field, the bigger the GOP field for president, the better chance Donald Trump has, a, has, has of, uh, of uh, getting nominated. Better chances he's going to run. In fact, I think he will get nominated with this anymore because Nikki Hill, all people in Nikki Hill who support Nikki Hill are going to peel votes away from from DeSantis. Trump already has his twenty five three percent of the base already. Even if it's shrinking right now, he still has the most of that base. So the the play, in my opinion, the play here isn't for more people coming the race. Which, but then again, you know, whatever. It, it all depends on what your ultimate goal is. If, if the ultimate goal is, is to Get Trump out the paint, then the, the the play should be should be here. It should be supporting one candidate and make sure you call that for that candidate, and then way that all the votes go to that candidate. And for, obviously, what we're hearing now is that what we hear from many people is that Ron DeSantis is the only other op, big major option that can be, only option that can be defeat Trump um, in the nomination. But again, these these the, I like these candidates have or potential candidates have uh, other things on their mind and you know other reasons what to do to what what to do grow their brand and. Position themselves, like I said earlier, you know, to whatever higher, you know, party, uh, you know, thing. I'm saying right now, the more people that come in this race, and you're hearing Tim Scott next to probably declare to run for president, the more people in the race, the better for Donald Trump. So Donald Trump's odds of getting becoming president or becoming a nominee, Republican nominee, are increasing day by day. And Nikki Haley is just added, added to that. So. But good luck to her. Good luck to her on how she does. I, I doubt she'll make it past the second or third uh, caucus. <laughs> you know, but we'll see. I, I, I've been wrong before. Uh, media news here. Mina Kimes is about to become a free agent from ESPN. I don't know when exactly. But it's, it's, it's pretty soon. Um, I think Mina Kimes is one of the most talented people in, in sports media, especially uh, given the fact that she knows her football. A lot. She, she's fucking fantastic. She has her own podcast um, with Lenny, of course. Um, she also appears on First Take with Stephen A. Smith and company, and during the football season, she knows her shit. And I think she's gonna be she's she's gonna be one of the most sought after free agents for other p- potential jobs outside ESPN um, that we've seen in a while. Um, she's so freaking talented. 
Um, I, I saw that Dan Lambert had already put it put a, a tweet out because I Bill Simmons post is really, really interested in signing her. To what Bill Simmons to what uh, Dan Lambert said, well, be, be getting back online. Of course, Dan Lambert and Mina Kimes have a very good relationship because they he, she used to be when Lambert was on, when the Lambert show was on ESPN prior to two thousand twenty one. Mina Kimes was a regular on that show. Was one of the you know she wasn't part of the show, but she was one of those extras that came on very often. She's still very close to to the staff, especially now, uh, even now, um, since leaving, uh, since them leaving uh, ESPN. Um, but I think anybody that uh, first of all, I mean the same stuff with ESPN. If you, if you let her walk, you're fucking stupid. <laughs> you are fucking stupid because M- Mina Kimes is fantastic, and she's a woman, and she's gorgeous. You know, you're losing a lot of pot- a lot of potential eyeballs here because of who it is and what she knows and how good she is in her job. So if you're ESPN, make sure you sign this girl to it. Lock her up, man. She's she's really that good. Okay? It's a saint. All right. One more thing before we get out of here. Uh, this, I don't think I'm doing another podcast between now and Saturday. So uh, just saying that uh, Thursday, it, well, it's going to be put out on Thursday, Thursday morning. Um, but the Saturday is e, uh, the ESPN. <laughs> WWE Elimination Chamber. It is the last uh, premium live event slash pay-per-view. Before WrestleMania, so after after the Saturday, we'll have a six week uh, rundown to WrestleMania. Six week plus whatever I'm gonna call that. So I'm um, looking forward to the show, of course. Um, and here's some of the matches here. I'll do a quick little preview and predictions here. Um, I know Brock Lesnar and Bobby Lash are gonna face each other up. I don't see any reason why Brock Lesnar should win this match. I see it's going either double DQ uh, or. Um, Bobby winning it, honestly, because I don't think Brock, could, I don't think Brock gets hurt anywhere, getting lost, getting losing a, a match, especially if it ha- happens on Unlimited Chamber as opposed to WrestleMania. It's, it's never hurt before, so why not? Why, why, why would it hurt now? Um, give me Bobby in this match. I'll take Bobby Lashley in this match. Uh, the second one was uh, we have the mixed tag match between Edge and Beth and, her, and his wife Beth Phoenix versus Judgment Day of uh, Finn Balor and Rhea Ripley. Uh, I want to say Rhea and uh, and Finn, because I feel like Rhea is on fire right now. I mean, I don't think a loss to her would hurt her necessarily either, but Rhea's on fire right now. Um, and she's going to WrestleMania. She I was running run the Rumble last month. She's going to go to WrestleMania face face the uh, I think it's Charlotte. Keep her hot, man. Uh, give me I, even if it makes it was not just her match, but keep her hot. I, I'm going to go uh, Rhea and Finn. For the win here, because I don't think Edge and Edge can get hurt here. Edge can get hurt here, or or, or Beth Phoenix. Both of them are older. Both of them are are are, are getting young the young talent over. So why would you, you know, do that now? So, all right, we have the uh, undisputed WWE champion, Universal Championship match between uh, Sami Z- the newly departed uh, Sami Zayn from the Bun Line versus and against Roman Reigns. Uh, look, I, I don't think there's any chance that Sami wins the title. Come out, here, come out of here. I can see Sam winning by disqualification. Same with Silver Twelve. Roman lost to to Seth last year, Royal Rumble. But there's no way I see Sammy losing this, losing the damn belt, or or, or Roman losing, losing the damn belt. You know, as, as much as I want to see Sammy Zayn actually win a title, I don't see him as that. I see him. I don't know. It's just maybe just my whole perception of what a champion looks like in WWE for forty years. You know, but uh, give me. I'll I'll take Roman, but if Sammy wins, it'd be by by DQ. It won't be by a it won't be a clean clean win. Because there's no way how Roman's going to WrestleMania without the belt. The only way I ever saw that scenario playing out is if The Rock was uh, involved. So that's that. And as you know, right now The Rock is not involved currently. All right, we have uh, the let me see the matches we have here. Hold on one second. Okay, yeah, we have uh, two elimination chamber matches. First for, for the females. We got uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, six contestants. Each one we have: Oscar, Liv Morgan, Nikki Cross, Raquel Rodriguez, Natalia, and Carmella in the women's chamber. I want to pick Oscar. Two seems pretty easy. The wild card here probably is Raquel Rodriguez, but I'm going to take Oscar. I don't think there's no way he'll have Natalia going to the title picture or Carmella going to the title picture. Um, knowing how you see Nikki Cross doing it, so to me the only two and possible third is Liv Morgan. That's it. But I'm going to take Asuka because she makes more sense. 
And finally, the men's match, the men's elimination, elimination chamber match for their spot for the WWE U.S. Championship. We got Austin Theory, Seth Rollins, Johnny Gargano, Bronson Reed, uh, Damian Priest, and Montez Ford. I feel like the only one that makes sense here is probably Austin Theory. Who who needs to jump here? Who's on fire here? Like Seth is at a point. I mean, Seth's been taking a lot of losses anyway, honestly. But uh, I don't know. Uh, to me, it's either going to be Seth or Theory. Um, I don't see Gargano winning it. I don't see Bronson Reed winning it. Damian Priest could be a wild card. Uh, Montez Ford, if he was taken more seriously, as, a, as a, if it pushed him more as a solo star, maybe I could see Montez even surprising folks. But I want to take Theory here. Theory, yeah, Theory wins it here. Actually, this is the U.S. Chat, chat title here. So technically, this is the... Uh, the U.S. The winner of this uh, chamber match wins the U.S. The US title. I think Theory keeps it at least WrestleMania. So that's it. My nose and stuff. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get out of here. Um, Ernest Christian, of course, here. Ernest Speaking Podcast. Uh, Ernest Speaking. Uh, um, let me see here. Oh, Mark Briscoe's All Elite. Congratulations. Um, I'll, keep, I'll let you guys know what's going on with, with the health stuff. I'm gonna be focusing a lot on that. I'm 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 probably, I'm, I'm probably gonna really lay low on social media for a while and just focus on therapy on this therapy stuff. Um, so hopefully you get another podcast in between now and at least Monday or Tuesday. But most likely it'll be, it'll be a while. I'm gonna lay low a little bit and focus on therapy and the family and all that stuff. And plus it's all start breaking on really what's going on. So unless anything big goes on, you hear my nose is still stuffy. So uh, um, EJ Christian Seven on Twitter. Earth speaking podcast across all podcast catchers. Surprise, guys! Please subscribe, especially to my YouTube page, uh, youtube.com slash Ernest Christian. Uh, no, no, youtube.com forward slash at Ernest Christian. Check the YouTube page, of course. I'm out of here. Love you guys. Uh, enjoy your weekend, enjoy your week, whatever. Enjoy your days. Uh, stay positive, stay up, and uh, yeah, love someone, <laughs> I guess, right? <laughs> Later. <laughs> I'm not afraid to